Well, church, you're going to be blessed this morning. We know that we have a word in season to help you exactly where you're at. So would you lean in, settle in, press in for God's Word this morning as Boyd comes and speaks to us. Hey, everybody. Welcome to Church Online. Thank you for taking the time to join us this morning. I want to share a message. I pray that will bless you and build your faith. But before we get into the message, can I encourage you as a church, we're starting 21 days of prayer tomorrow. Uh, make sure you download the prayer guides from our church website. Uh, if there's ever a time for the church to pray, now is the time. Uh, let's join together. Let's journey together over the next 21 days as we pray. Well, this morning, I want to speak to us about having unchanged unshakable joy, unshakable joy. I want to talk to us about uh, having joy in the midst of challenging circumstances. One of my favorite Bible characters, in fact, one of my heroes in the entire Bible is the Apostle Paul. Uh, the Apostle Paul uh, is the most qualified person to talk on the subject. He talks about joy uh, in the book of Philippians. Here he is in prison with Silas, uh, chained, uh, beaten up, uh, locked up, uh, and miraculously God set them free as they began to praise and worship God. But while they were in prison, Paul writes these letters to the church. And, and in these letters, he covers a topic that is relevant to all of us today, especially in this COVID season. In, this, in these letters, um, the book of Philippians, Paul talks about learning uh, to have joy no matter what. Learning to have joy no matter what. In fact, Paul mentions the words joy or rejoice 16 times in the book of Philippians. Uh, the irony of this book is that Paul is not writing these letters uh, from, a, from a tropical island sitting by the beach uh, or, or in a hotel or on stage. Let me tell you, he's writing these letters in a Roman jail. The Roman jail would have been completely different to our, our prisons today. Uh, they would have been underground with no sunlight, uh, he would have been chained to a palace guard 24 hours a day. So there was no privacy. Uh, so he was under maximum security awaiting execution. Uh, so here he is in the city of Rome. This was his dream city to go and to preach the gospel to thousands. That was his dream, but God had other plans for Paul. Here he is in a prison. He's arrested and he ends up in jail, chained to a palace guard. Uh, despite uh, his dire circumstances, Paul writes these words in the book of Philippians chapter 1, verses 3 to 6 in your notes. And on the screen, it says, I thank my God every time I remember you. In all my prayers for all of you, I always pray with joy. I love this. Because of your partnership in the gospel from the first day until now, being confident of this, that he who began a good work in you will carry it on to completion until the day of Christ Jesus. I want us to stop and ask ourselves this question. Uh, would that be something I would write if I was in Paul's situation? If I was in prison, locked up, beaten, chained, you know, dark, dingy prison, will I be saying I'm filled with joy every time I think of you? Here I'm praying with joy every time I think of you. Let me tell you, I'll be like, get me out of here. What is taking so long? Help. I'll be like, Shaz, get me out of here. I don't want to be here. I won't be using words like joy or rejoice. But here is Apostle Paul. He's like, every time I think of you, I pray with joy. Uh, you know, the exact opposite attitude to what we normally have when we go through a bad day. Our human nature is to complain, to whine, and to start becoming negative. Uh, we have bad attitudes when things don't go the way we want them to. And that's why I love the book of Philippians, because in this book, Paul talks to us about how to have joy when we go through tough times. He talks to us about how to have a joyful attitude when we have bad days, how to have joy when we face challenging circumstances because here's the reality. All of us have bad days. It doesn't matter who you are. It doesn't matter how anointed you are or how successful you are. All of us have bad days. Bad days are inevitable. There's no such thing as problem-free life. One of the marks of a mature Christian is how we respond to our bad days. And I have learned that God specializes in bringing something good out of our bad days. 
And I love Paul's attitude in these letters. Here he is in a dark, dingy prison, and he says this. And he says this, I am certain, I am confident. Remember, he's not saying this on a stage. Here he is in a dark, dingy prison, locked up. You know, he's, un, you know, he's chained to a palace guard, and he says these words, I am confident that he who began a good work in you is faithful to complete it. Can I get a big amen this morning? Can I encourage you with this? If God started a good work in you, he is faithful to complete it. Well, how does Paul do this? How does he have that attitude in the midst of such challenging circumstances? How does he stay positive in prison? How does he have this confidence in God in spite of what is he going through? How did he do it? Well, as you study the book of Philippians, as you study these letters, we discuss discovered that Paul had something far better than just happiness. He had this thing called joy. He had this thing called joy, unshakable joy. Most of us today, uh, we're in the pursuit of happiness. In fact, there is a movie called The Pursuit of Happiness, one of my favorite movies. Our human desire is to have a perfect life where everything goes well. We have a perfect life, perfect family, perfect marriage, perfect friends, perfect, perfect job, perfect church, perfect uh, children, where life is just perfect. But the reality is it never quite works out that way. But I'm here to tell you today that you can have something that supersedes happiness and it's called joy. But truth be told, only a few discover it. Most people chase after happiness instead of discovering this greater principle of joy. My prayer for today is that through the power of the Holy Spirit, as we listen to this message today, we will discover joy, ultimate joy. But before we go too far, I want us to stop for a moment and look at the difference between happiness and joy because they are two different things. A lot of people get them confused. We think they mean the same thing. but In fact, they mean two different things. For other things. I want us to stop for a moment and, and look at the difference between, hap between happiness and joy. If you're taking notes, let me encourage you to write this down. Happiness is dependent on external, circumstance, external circumstances, but joy is found within. Happiness is dependent on external circumstances, but joy is found within. Happiness is dependent on external factors. When the sun is shining, I'm happy. But when the sun is not shining, I'm not happy, especially on a Sunday. It irritates me. Happiness is dependent on external factors, but joy is found within meaning. Joy is not based on the conditions of the circumstances around me. Joy, joy actually comes from within. Have you ever watched two people go through the same situation, but they have different reactions towards it? Uh, you know, the reason is that some choose to dwell in and on the situation while others don't. They don't let the external factors determine their inner joy. Happiness um, is found on external factors. Joy is found within. Here's another one. Happiness is an emotion. Joy is a state of being. Happiness is an emotion. Joy is a state of being. I look at the Apostle Paul. And you know, this guy had a rough life in the book of 2 Corinthians chapter 11. He lists these things that he went through. If Paul had a CV, this is what it would say. Five times he received the 39 lashes that Jesus received. Five times. Uh, the Bible says he was beaten with rock rods. He was shipwrecked. He was stoned. They threw rocks to kill him. I mean, the list goes on and on and on and on. I mean, this guy had a rough life. And then he says this in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verses 16 to 17. Therefore, we do not lose heart, though outwardly we are wasting away, yet inwardly we are being renewed day by day. For our light and momentary troubles are achieving for us an eternal glory that far outweighs them all. So we fix our eyes not on what is seen, but on what is unseen. Since what is seen is temporary, but what is unseen is eternal. He's like, inwardly, I'm, 
I've got a different dynamic going on, even though outwardly I'm wasting away. That's my hope for all of us in this season. That's my hope for, hope for all of us when we go through tough times. You can have an outward dynamic that is different from your inward dynamic. And you can have an inward dynamic that is different to your outward dynamic. Outward dynamic. But here is the thing. You're in trouble if you let your outward dynamic determine your inward dynamic. Let me tell you, don't let external factors determine your inner peace. Don't let external circumstances, external factors steal your inner joy. Happiness is an emotion. Joy is a state of being. Here's another one. Happiness comes from the environment you're in, but joy comes from God. In other words, you're totally at the mercy of the environment you're in, the circle that you are standing in. Let me tell you, don't let the circle that you're standing in determine your inward dynamic because joy offers something far better, something way better than that. Joy is based on Christ. Joy is based uh, on your relationship with Christ. Here's another truth about happiness and joy. Write this down. Happiness evaporates in suffering. Joy is intensified in suffering. Happiness evaporates in suffering. Uh, in suffering. Joy is intensified in suffering. Happiness evaporates. Happiness dif- d- disappears when you go through tough times. But joy is different. Joy is strengthened in the fire. Joy is strengthened in the storm. Joy is strengthened in the shakings. Joy is strengthened in the oppositions, in the criticism. When all hell breaks loose, guess what? Happiness disappears, but joy is strengthened. Maybe you are watching this service right now and you may have lost your job. Maybe you were made redundant this week. Can I encourage you with this? Joy has this attitude. Yeah, I may have lost my job, but I have a God who is faithful. Maybe your marriage is going through a tough time right now. Can I tell you, joy has this attitude. My God is faithful. God is for me. Maybe you're going through a a tough season in your health. Maybe you've been given a tough health diagnosis. Can I tell you, joy has this attitude. My God is my healer. Uh, Here's the last point about happiness and joy. Happiness is temporary. Joy is everlasting. Happiness is temporary. Joy is everlasting. 2 Corinthians 4, 18. So we fix our eyes not on what is seen, but on what is unseen. Since what is seen is temporary, but what is unseen is eternal. This beaten, bleeding apostle, here he is in a dark, dingy prison, chained to a palace guard, abandoned, He's in an underground prison, yet he is grateful and full of joy. How does he do that? Because Paul discovered that joy outweighs happiness. Joy outweighs happiness. Let me tell you, I want that kind of attitude. I want that for my life. I want that for my children. I want that for my family. I want that for my, uh, you know, for my marriage. I want that for our church. I want that for you. I want that for every single person watching that service, watching the service right now. Can I tell you, it's available for all of us. So the question is, how do we have joy in the midst of challenging circumstances? How do we have joy when we face bad days? How do we, how do we have joy when all hell breaks loose? How did Paul have joy in the midst of all these challenging circumstances? circumstances? What was his secret? Well, if the apostle Paul was preaching this message right now, if he was talking to you right now, he would say, these are three things that you need to do. Here's the first one. Number one, have the right perspective. Have the right perspective. Have you ever been in the middle of a situation and you, find your, and you found yourself asking this question, why? You're like, God, why me? Why am I going through this situation? Why am I going through this tough time? Why is this happening to me? Listen to this carefully. You can die in your whys. If you dwell in your whys, you will never find your solution. You can get stuck in your whys trying to figure it out. Too many of us, we get stuck in our whys. We, kept, we keep asking God, why me? Why am I going through this? Why is this happening to me? Why God? Why God? Let me tell you, God never made a promise that this place was 
going to be perfect. In fact, in John 16, verse 33, he says, In this world you will have trouble, but take heart, I have overcome the world. Paul knew in the midst of all of the things going wrong, in fact, he had this dream to go and preach to thousands in the city of Rome, but here he is in prison, locked up, but he knew that God had a plan and a solution for what he was going through. In Philippians 1.12, he says, Now I want you to know, brothers and sisters, that what has happened to me has actually served to advance the gospel. He's saying what has happened to me has helped advance the gospel. So he refused to ask why. Instead, he started asking what. What is God doing in this situation? What is God trying to do? Uh, in my suffering? What is the purpose behind this? He started asking what? Let me tell you, that's where we discover joy. It's in that question that we discover ultimate joy. Let me tell you, I hope there is a Q&A session in heaven because there is a lot of whys. There is a lot of questions I have for God. When I get to heaven, there are things that I went through. I want to ask God, God, why, why did I go through that? What was the reason for it? I want to ask God. I hope there's a Q&A session when we get to heaven. And I want, I, I want to ask God things like, why did he create a giraffe? I mean, what's the point of a giraffe? I mean, I mean what's, this, what's the deal with zebras? I mean, zebras and giraffes, and I've offended all the people that love giraffes and zebras, and I'm getting distracted. So here's the first one. Stop asking why. Have the right perspective. Number two, look for the best in every situation. Look for the best in every situation. Do you want to know what God was up to with the Apostle Paul while he was in prison? Let me tell you, while he was in prison, he ended up writing half of the New Testament. Paul wanted to go and preach to thousands in the city of, of Rome, but God had other plans. Paul discovered new opportunities while he was in prison. Maybe you're going through a tough time right now. Can I encourage you? Have the right perspective. Focus on what really matters. Don't look at the problem. Look for the opportunity. Listen to this carefully. In every one of your bad days is a new opportunity. In every one of your bad days is a new opportunity. That's where you discover joy. Philippians 1, 13 to 14, Paul says, As a result, it has become clear throughout the whole palace garden to everyone else that I'm in chains for Christ. And because of my chains, most of the brothers uh, and sisters have become confident in the Lord and dare all the more to proclaim the gospel without fear. Paul is saying, well, I didn't get to preach on stage so I will preach to the guy I'm chained to. Now listen to this carefully. There is not a more strategic, strategic group that Paul could witness to if he's going to reach the Roman Empire because these palace guards that he was chained to, they were chosen by Caesar. They were the elite Roman troops of the Roman Empire. When they retired after 12 years, they were made leaders of the Roman uh, Empire. So Paul is chained to the future leaders of, of Rome. And here's the thing, they, he was chained to them every four hours. He was given a new palace guard. In other words, Paul witnessed to 4,380 guards uh, that he was uh, chained to in that prison. Can I tell you, Paul is saying, I'm getting more done here uh, than I was getting, out, uh, getting done out there. I'm getting more done here uh, in prison than I would be on stage. God has a purpose behind every situation. There is something good in every situation. And, and Paul is like, I'm going to discover it. Like I said a few weeks ago, the storm that was sent to break you ends up being the storm that God uses to make you. Mature disciples say, in the midst of tough times, in the midst of bad times, in the midst of all the challenging situation situations, I'm going to find the good. There is something good to be discovered. And I love this, Romans 8, 28. And we know that in all good things, sorry, we know that in all things, God works for the good of those who love Him, who have been called according to His purpose. 
what you're going through right now, God can turn it around. In fact, what was intended to harm you, God will turn it around for good. Paul would say, have the right perspective. You know, number three, keep the main thing, the main thing. Keep the main thing, the main thing. A lot of, uh, you know, things matter to us, but in light of eternity, it's only a few things that really matters. When we go through tough times, we need the wisdom and the, and the discernment to really focus on what really matters. Keep the main thing, the main thing. We can live our lives based on problems or priorities. Problems or priorities. Paul is saying, if you want to know how to get over a bad day, have the right perspective. Focus on what really matters. Focus on what really counts. Philippians 1, 15 to 18. It is true that some preach out of envy and rivalry, but others out of goodwill. The latter do so out of love, knowing that I'm put here for the defense of the gospel. The former preach out of selfish ambition, not sincerely supposing that they can stir up trouble for me while I'm in chains. But what does it matter? The important thing is that in every way, whether from false motives or true, Christ has preached. And because of this, I rejoice, yes, and I will continue to rejoice. While Paul was in prison, people were criticizing him and there were others that were trying to stir things up. Uh, they were, they were complete, um, complaining and pointing the finger at Paul. And Paul's like, why does it matter? I'm not going to let any of those things get to me. I'm going to focus on what really matters. Uh, what really matters is that Christ is preached. In other words, saying, Paul is saying, stay on mission. Keep the main thing, the main thing. And he, and he finishes with this, I will continue to rejoice. In the midst of the bad days and challenging circumstances, Paul chose to have a better attitude, not better attitude, better attitude. I'm praying this for all of us today. I want you to imagine with me for a moment. Here is Paul. They say to him, we're going to lock you up. He's like, go ahead. I'll preach to the palace guard. I'll continue to write. You know, in fact, I might start on that project. I might start writing the book of Colossians. He's like, I'll write. I'll you know, I'll write half of the New Testament. Then they say to him, well, if that doesn't scare you, we're going to kill you. Paul says, would you please go ahead and do that because I've got this great dilemma. And he puts this dilemma in Philippians 1.21. For to me, to live is Christ and to die is gain. He's like, I can't decide which one is better. If I live, I get to preach. I get to Preach to the palace guards. I get to write. If I die, I get to meet Jesus. He's like, doesn't matter what happens. It's a win-win situation for me. I mean, what can you do to a guy with that kind of attitude? Let me tell you, there is no circumstances that can change that kind of attitude, that kind of joy. Paul is in prison. They've taken everything away from him. His ministry, his friends, his freedom, his privacy, they took everything from him except one thing that cannot be taken away. And that is a purpose to live for. He says, for me to live is Christ and to die is gain. He had a purpose for living. For me to live is, what would your answer be? How would you fill that blank spot there? For me to live is, what would it be for you? For some, it would be for me to live is pleasure. Some would say, for me to live is power. For me to live is having the right image, having the right friends. For me to live is to sleep around. For me to live, live is popularity. For me to live is riches, fame. Let me tell you, the, let me tell you the problem with all of those things are, is, is that they are external factors. They are temporary. The secret of joy is based on, on a relationship with Christ. I want you to listen to this. That's where you will discover everlasting joy. Everything else is, is temporary. It's our relationship with Jesus Christ. That's where true joy is found. Do you know Him? This morning, I want to give you an opportunity to say yes to Jesus. 
Maybe you're watching this service right now and you feel far away from God. You feel like miles away from God. Well, the Bible says in the book of Ephesians that sin is a barrier between you and God. Sin separates us from God. But here's the good news. Jesus came from heaven to earth and he died on the cross uh, to get rid of that barrier so that you can come close to God. Here is a promise from God. If you draw near to me, I will draw near to you. Today, will you draw near to God? Will you pray this prayer? I want to give you an opportunity. This is not a pr uh, prayer to you know, sign up to a church, even though that is important. This is a prayer where you're saying, you know what? I don't want religion. I want a relationship. The creator of the heavens and the earth, the creator of this universe, the one who created you, he wants to have a relationship with you. If that is you. Would you pray this prayer with me? Maybe you prayed this prayer before, but you walked away from God. Or maybe this is the first time you're going to pray this prayer. Can I encourage you to pray this prayer from the bottom of your heart? Would you pray this after me? Dear Jesus, I confess I'm a sinner in need of a Savior. Thank you for dying on the cross for me. I ask you for forgiveness. I invite you into my life. I make you my Lord and Savior. I believe in Jesus. Amen. Friends, if you prayed that prayer, let me tell you, first, firstly, congratulations. You made the best decision of your life. In a moment, Sharon will come and tell you your next, day, next step. But I want to say to you, I am so proud of you. Today is a new day. There is a party happening in heaven. We are so proud of you. Keep following Jesus, the greatest day of your life. Here is Sharon to tell you of your next step. God bless you. Wow, church, we hope and pray that you were blessed by that message this morning. I know for me personally, that was a word in season. And you know what? If you put your hand up today, if you said yes to Jesus, we just wanna say a huge congratulations to you. That is seriously the best decision that you could ever make. And you know what? Don't just sit there quietly. Let us know because we were called to do this Christian walk together. We are so much better together. So all you need to do is click that link that's coming up in the chat right now that says, I said yes to Jesus and says, I put my hand up. Click that link and our team will be in touch with you. We will help you get started on this walk of faith. We will get a Bible into your hands. A huge congratulations to you. We are so excited and thrilled that you made that decision today. Well, church, this is pretty much the end of our service. But before we go, I just wanna pray a prayer of blessing over you and your family as you head into this new week. So wherever you are, would you just lift your hands with me and I'm just gonna pray. Father, we just thank You for Your presence in this place. God, I thank You for Your presence that is right now invading every home, Lord God. And Father, I just pray for Your peace to follow Your presence, Lord Jesus, that every person watching this right now under the sound of my voice would sense a great dose of Your peace and Your love filling their hearts right now, covering their minds right now. And God, we just claim and pray the blood, blood of Jesus over every home, over every family. Lord, You know every circumstance. So God, would You be present in every moment this week. We pray for wisdom, Lord God, as we go into every conversation, into every room, into every meeting, Lord God. Give our church, give every member wisdom, we pray. And I just pray right now that the Lord would bless you and keep you that He would cause His face to shine upon you, that He would lift up His countenance upon you and give you His peace, both now and forevermore. In Jesus' Name we pray, Amen. God bless you. We'll see you next week.